Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a show of panel three energy management in real life. Um, my name is Reinhard Ungerbeck. I was supposed to present this uh, panel together with Hannes van Knoring. Van Knoring. He, unfortunately, he went, uh, fell sick this morning uh, and we get, got a great replacement for him. It's Helene Johansson, which I, uh, I say thank you. Thank you, a warm thank you to you that you um, uh, jumped in. About uh, this panel three, energy management. We were looking for um, submissions uh, for energy management in real life because we have heard a lot about energy management in theory and a lot of uh, small modules for energy management, energy management systems informal management systems and so on. We wanted to see as much experience as possible about energy management systems in practice. I'm pretty sure that we were successful in finding very interesting uh, presentations uh, about uh, energy management. And in the first uh, session today, uh, I'm happy to, to have uh, three panelists uh, in, in, in the session. Uh, it's uh, David Accordini, Kelly from, from Italy, Kelly Smith from uh, Australia, and Shanka Erani uh, from California. Um, welcome uh, to, um, to, to, the, to the conference in Gothenburg. We pretend that it's in, in Gothenburg, uh, just with, um, let's say, three or four different time zones. So to summarize it, we have uh, Kelly in, in Australia uh, with a time of uh, about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Then we have uh, David and me in the Central European time. We have two o'clock uh, afternoon. And we have uh, Shanka Erni um, who just got up, I think. Uh, and we would understand if you would have a big mug of uh, coffee next to you. Got it. Ah, great. <laughs> okay. Um, I would say, yeah, some information about uh, how to, to use the, uh, the, the Hoover app. We would like to ask you uh, to, for, to, to participate in, in this session uh, through interesting uh, questions, which you would uh, put into the Q&A section in the Hoover app. Helena uh, will uh, collect these questions and after each presentation, she will um, summarize the, the most important questions uh, and, and ask them to the, to the presenters. And there's also the possibility for the, all the participants to vote on the question. So if you think uh, a question is particularly uh, interesting, give it a vote uh, so we see which questions are um, the most interesting uh, to the audience. Okay. Um, now we're going to start with the first presentation. Uh, it will be had, held by uh, David Accordini. Uh, David is a PhD candidate at uh, Politecnico di Milano. In his research, he investigates the impact that the adoption of industrial energy efficiency measures has on the operations and the other productive resources of a company. And his presentation will be about better understanding of the impacts on the industrial operations from the adoption of energy efficiency measures, lessons learned from Italian real use cases. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, as you correctly said, I, uh, I'm studying the impact that the adoption of efficiency measure have uh, on, uh, on the production plan. And for this, uh, we developed uh, a framework and applied it uh, uh, directly in field. So now I have uh, 15 minutes or something less to show you why I think this is important. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, wait. Okay. Uh, I have some problem moving the slides actually. Okay. So, um, yeah, everybody of us know that uh, energy efficiency is important, and this is true especially for the industrial sector. Uh, no, wait. Uh, can you please move to the previous slide? 
Okay. Um, yeah, do we have to ask you for moving the slide because I cannot control them? Yes, if you just ask me when you're ready, that would be okay, great. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I was saying uh, energy efficiency is important, uh, but uh, we know it is still scarce implemented. The industrial assessment centers speak about 47% uh, of uh, not implementation rate. So we have this phenomenon, this uh, so-called energy efficiency gap. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, literature investigated uh, this phenomenon. And uh, so we have this concept of barrier that are somehow hindering the adoption, right? And what is really interesting is that the investment cost, which is generally perceived as a very big issue, cover actually the, exist the existence of other problems. And they are mainly related to information. So information which lead to uh, this perception of risk and uncertainty, which in the end prevent the adoption. So what I'm trying to do with this work is to actually uh, provide decision maker with a framework, with some sort of practical tool to enable them to know what the implementation of an efficiency measure means in terms of impact on the production plan. So, um, can you change the slide, please? Okay, very briefly, um, what we are trying to do is to work on three different, uh, three different features. That are on, on the one hand, uh, the characteristic uh, of intervention. So a system which is able to provide the entire set uh, of uh, uh, characteristics indeed, which, which can uh, describe in a synthetic but exhaustive way the intervention. On the other hand, we want, we want to work uh, with a performance measurement system. So to identify which uh, performance indicator, which KPI are impacted by a certain intervention. And in the end, we want to connect them. So to understand what characteristics work on which impact. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, sorry, I think you missed one, no? No, okay, anyway. So, um, sorry, the main, the main idea is usually when we uh, study the impact of an intervention, we go directly with the, we work with a specific uh, energy efficiency measure. What we're trying to do here is to develop uh, a more general tool so that instead of connecting an intervention with the impact, we want to decompose this intervention in a series of characteristics uh, with the aim of connecting these single characteristics to the impact so that we have a more general tool which can be applied to any type of efficiency intervention applied in an industrial plan. So uh, I'm presenting very briefly the, the result of the, fra the, the framework because uh, that uh, later we will see it uh, in the application. So for what concerns the PMS, the performance measurement system, we identify 124 basic KPI, which are organized uh, along three macro areas, data production, social, and the environment, which are usually uh, the areas uh, used to, to work with, the, um, with energy efficiency. And very important, we are studying uh, the, uh, the KPI at shop floor level because we think this is the first level where the consequences of the adoption are, are identified. Uh, next slide. On the other hand, we want to work with these, uh, with these characteristics. So characteristics are basically these, um, let's say, elementary units which can be used to decompose an intervention and describe it. So just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, Considering, for instance, as efficiency measure, the replacement of a hydraulic injection molding machine with the electric one, a certain characteristic could be, for instance, the, type, the fact that we have saving, the, the fact that the activity type is a replacement of devices, the technical expertise that is needed for replacement, and so on. Uh, next slide. So um, in the end, uh, uh, what we had uh, as characteristics, uh, we have ex ante, we call them ex ante because they are directly impacting on the KPI and they are referred to objective and type. So is it the conservation or an efficiency measure? Uh, the activity types, a procedure, optimization, or recovery, and so on. Then there are some related to the implementation, time and check frequency, personal related or additional requirements, which means uh, do we need other devices to be installed? 
Does it have any sort of dependency with other components or other intervention? Uh, next. But also, um, we understood that there were some other characteristics which were not directly impacting on the performance, but they could have uh, uh, a moderating or enabling effect on the first one. And they are mainly related to the context or the, to the implementation. So for instance, company related, the size, the energy importance, the layout, the saturation level, but also measure related. Is it a, uh, an ancillary or a, core, uh, or a core measure? How many devices it is affecting? Which is the dimension of the area? Uh, or decisional, is it insourced or outsourced? And next slide, please. And eventually uh, the connection. This is what I tried to explain you, uh, explain you um, previously. So instead of uh, working as in picture one, so we have a specific intervention with specific impact, the idea behind the work is to move through um, picture two to picture two until picture three. So, so um, decomposing an intervention in basic characteristics, studying which are the impact from each characteristics and then composing them back uh, um, together to have, a, a, let's say, a general, uh, a general tool. Uh, next. So um, we applied this, uh, this framework to a sample of companies, which is heterogeneous uh, for what concerns size, energy intensity sector, and considering 23 uh, energy efficiency measure, both cross-cutting and, uh, and process specific, the aim of the application was, for, uh, of course, to understand which are the relationship and uh, the applicability of the model, because it's intended uh, as a sort of a practical uh, instrument to support, uh, to support decision makers. So user friendliness and effort required. Uh, next. And uh, okay, we are going to uh, we are going through a, a simple example of the application. Uh, in this case, the company was a medium size uh, belonging to the plastic production, and it was an energy intensive company. Uh, basically, the process was about the realization of plastic uh, medical components through injection molding machine. So the intervention is the same that we saw previously, and uh, very important, they are working in a controlled environment. Uh, next. Now, um, the first step for the application of this sort of framework is the characterization of, of the measure. So uh, attributing uh, specific values, values to, to the characteristics. And in this case, uh, we have an efficiency measure. It's a new installation, which required about one week for the company uh, with one time check. The corporate involvement was limited. This was due to the uh, single, uh, single device replaced. Um, and required maintenance and engineering personnel. And it had uh, an impact on the working environment, but we will see later on how. And um, okay, um, secondary devices, uh, regenerative braking system can be required. For what concerns the exposed characteristic, uh, we have seen uh, the dimension and the importance of the company. And uh, the machine work uh, is in a job shop layout, uh, which is not separated and is uh, easy or accessible. Um, and it, of course, it's, a, it's part of the core process of the company. Uh, with the limited uh, area interested uh, and a high level of acceptance from, uh, from the worker. For what concerns the sourcing strategy, they used a mixed approach. And the implementation time, the adoption was uh, uh, carried out in a single intervention. So next slide. Now, um, from these characteristics, uh, what we did was to uh, investigate which were the impact on the on the performance of the company. So, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, the um, the saving strategy was an efficiency measure means, of course, that they had uh, high energy savings, and this was very important for the company since they were an energy intensive one. However, efficiency means more than just energy savings. For instance, in this case, uh, uh, efficiency was applied to material. They had the huge saving in material, and especially they uh, could avoid the presence of oil because of the movement from an hydraulic machine to the electric one. The absence of oil was very important because of the fact that they are working with this clean environment, because the presence of oil leakages would mean uh, a disruption in production, would mean uh, um, that they had to stop, clean the white room, 
um, and then uh, uh, meaning uh, uh, losing a lot of time for doing for doing uh, this uh, this application. From the fact that this is a new uh, a new installation, so uh, beside the absence of oil, which moreover improve also the product uh, the quality of the product and save the materials, the new uh, the new equipment had a much higher accuracy, which means. Uh, uh, the scrap was reduced and the manufacturing time was in turn uh, was in turn improved, also reducing the time that worker had to spend uh, for the control and inspection operations. The setup time were reduced in turn, which had an impact on the, on the production capacity and the level of utilization. And, and of course, availability and reliability were, were impacted as well, with uh, uh, a non-negligible impact in the downtime for maintenance and, uh, and operation. And again, as I saw previously, the cleaning operation were really uh, highly impacted, and this was one of the main driver that moved for the for the adoption of uh, of the intervention. Production disruption was really uh, a problem for for this company. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for what concerned the implementation time, as I said, we uh, the company took about one week. Uh, however, it was carried out during the winter shutdown of the company. So it didn't uh, if, uh, affect the, the production. Actually, they have uh, a limited production disruption because of testing and tuning, ac tuning activities which have to be uh, carried out uh, during the normal activities. Uh, of course, uh, the fact that they carried out this, uh, this intervention in, during the shutdown had an effect uh, on production capacity for sure, but also on the uh, availability of, uh, of over time and indirectly, this could also affect uh, the satisfaction of customer, not only in, in terms of quality, but also in timing for, for the shipment. However, this last feature was not uh, uh, still checked about. It was just an hypothesis at the time of the application. Um, the fact that they had just one time check uh, added no information to, um, to the application. So next slide, please. Um, corporate involvement. Uh, was uh, was limited because uh, they um, they outsourced uh, um, the greater share of the of the operations. However, um, internal personnel was uh, still impacted for what concerned maintenance uh, and also and also supervision. Moreover, again, the fact that they have this uh, um, cleaning environment means that uh, the quality the quality uh, department was involved for the revalidation after the the substitution of the, of the device. And eventually, uh, when we are dealing with this type uh, of, of activity of replacement, it always has an impact for what concerns knowledge and expertise required both during the design phase and the implementation phase. In both of, um, I'm talking about training, uh, I'm talking about the involvement of engineering for the design phase and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, during the service phase, uh, they registered um, an, uh, an improvement in the, in the working environment for what concerns noise and vibration. Which were, which were definitely improved. And for this reason, they were, um, they were verifying the possibility to avoid uh, the use of, uh, of earplugs for, for the worker, which could uh, uh, improve their, um, their working situation. Moreover, the absence of oil uh, was for sure a, a, positive, uh, uh, you know, um, a positive factor for what concerns health and safety. Um, and indirectly, this could lead this could lead to uh, improvement in production, improvement in productivity, in control operation. So this could have uh, an in both direct, but also and most important, direct effect for what concerns the operations of uh, uh, of a company. Next slide. And uh, eventually, as I was saying, a regenerative braking system is usually suggested with this type. Uh, of replacement, however, because of mainly because of uh, the increased cost, this was not uh, adopted by the company. Uh, next one. So, um, what I I tried to uh, to pass with this uh, with this presentation and with this framework is mainly the fact that energy efficiency is definitely not only uh, saving energy savings, but may have a, a very strong impact on what concern operation and productive resources of a company. And this is exactly this example where th that we have just seen is exactly uh, the case because for sure, 
energy savings were important. We were dealing with an energy intensive company, but uh, the, main drive, the main driver for the adoption for that specific case was not energy savings, but was the impact on the operation, especially for what concerned the, uh, the absence of oil. So um, everything we have seen connected to it. And regarding the specific framework, it proved to be able to point out all these connections which were investigated in the field and pretty much easy to use for, for the final user. Um, of course, uh, this research is just, uh, is just a starting point. So for sure more research is needed. It's needed in terms of, uh, of sample, sample of companies and sample of efficiency measure investigated to have some sort of uh, um, statistical significance to the result. And future research should also um, take a, uh, a sort of um, objective quantification of the impact. This would for sure um, support decision maker and enable them to include all the impact that the adoption of efficiency measure could have in an investment decision, which as of today is not uh, usually done. So uh, I'm done, and if you wanna switch the other slide, okay. Uh, I hope it was uh, clear enough uh, and uh, that you enjoyed it. So thank you. Okay, thank you, David, um, for your very interesting presentation. Um, my next question is to Helene. Are there any questions in the Q&A section? Um, no, not that I can see. What a pity. No, everything was very clear. <laughs> Obviously. Okay, I so. <laughs> uh, okay. Still, I have one question because I'm quite interested in, in this topic of the non-energy benefits. Um, you uh, referred a lot to energy benefits and non-energy benefits. If you would look at these projects or companies that you have dealt with, um, what was more important for the decision makers in the companies? The energy benefits that can be quantified quite easily or the, the non-energy benefits that might be more uh, strategic decisions? Okay, um, so uh, I cannot really answer you. I mean, uh, every company was different situation in a sense that as you, as you just said, um, non-energy benefits are not really easily quantified. They're more sort of a strategic decision. So if companies had some sort of, of really important uh, issue, as the one is just presented with the oil leaks uh, and the really frequent downtime they had for this reason. So in these cases, for sure, the uh, non-energy part of the, the impact was, uh, was more important and was even determinant for, for the adoption. But uh, since it's pretty much difficult to quantify uh, in the other situation, uh, to, my, to my personal opinion right now, the energy uh, part is still more, uh, more important for the decision maker. I mean, it's sort of more sure for, for the adoption decision, right? You can uh, quantify it, you can have sort of a payback or an internal rate of return. So it's much more easier to handle. Okay, and would it make a, a difference to involve other stakeholders inside a company if you refer to non-energy benefits? Um, did you have this experience to have uh, mm. other people who want to discuss these, these measures because it's got an impact on their department or on their responsibility as well? Um, I mean, yeah, it can happen. Um, sometimes it would be um, maybe useful to, um, to include external stakeholder, right? Um, I'm talking about technology supplier or something like that, which, which could support in the adoption and providing a more, uh, let's say, complete picture of the consequences. Uh, internal stakeholder, uh, yeah, it can happen that some, some department may have more uh, uh, pressing uh, uh, needs uh, about this non-energy part of the benefit. Uh, but I guess it's, uh, it's pretty much depend on the specific, uh, specific case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, we have one question in the chat by uh, Anke, and I missed the, the surname. The method was only applied for this company. So far, so detailed. Or can you give some tendency for certain branches or technologies? Sorry for certain? Oh, certain 
branches? Um, okay. Um, no, actually, uh, we we applied for nine companies, and this is what I was saying in the last slide. So um, we don't have any statistical significance right now. We try to be more heterogeneous as possible for what concerns both the sample of companies and the one of technology. So we move for, for, for instance, we consider, uh, I don't know, some ancillary processes like HVAC or illumination. And also in, for, for instance, such in this case, uh, um, process, uh, process um, core processes, sorry. But uh, right now I don't have some, uh, let's say final, uh, um, detailed conclusion. It's just uh, single cases. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have the chance to uh, ask uh, further questions uh, after all the presentations, uh, if you like. And yeah. there's a warm invitation to all the uh, participants in the, in this panel to um, direct your questions to the to the presenters. Uh, also for the upcoming presentations. Um, the next presentation will be held by Kelly Smith. Uh, Kelly Smith is a PhD candidate at the University in Queensland, uh, who after nearly 20 years in industry returned to university, very interesting, uh, to investigate ways to improve industrial energy efficiency. Kelly is part of the, I hope I spell it correct, uh, UCAR, U UQ risk group, um, which focuses uh, on conducting real-world evidence-based research to deliver practical and impactful outcomes for industry. I'm looking forward to learn what UQ risk is. Yeah, And her presentation uh, will be about the human factors for energy management features, fit, and field study. Your turn, Kelly. Thank you, Reinhardt. Okay, so as, as Reinhard mentioned, I actually ended up back at university um, 20 years after I left when about 350 or so of my closest friends and I were made redundant after BP decided it didn't need an oil refinery in Brisbane anymore. But for four of the last five years I worked at the refinery, I actually looked after our energy management and carbon accounting program. Now, BP has been in the news a bit lately about trying to look at moving beyond fuels to something different. So, and even back then, they generally wanted to be a good corporate citizen um, and looking after your energy, like so energy management and energy efficiency was a good way to save money and emissions. So you'd think it would be a pretty easy job, but in fact, it, it really wasn't. Um, when I took on the role, it was very much a reporting role um, and I did find it quite difficult to make any meaningful changes. However, it was still one of my favorite jobs. And so when I found myself, um, that's not redundant, let's call it at a pivot point in my career, I thought I'd go back to university and spend some time investigating industrial energy efficiency. Um, and luckily I found a space at UQ to do that. Awesome. So being a good engineer, when I see something needs to be fixed, I try and have a look at what the problem is. I try and take a close look at that rather than just um, assume that we know what that is already. And so in this case, because I was back at university and trying to be a good researcher, I did that by diving into the literature to see what it had to say about energy management. And so, and what I was looking for is what it had to say about energy management in overall kind of sense. Um, and what I found, I don't think will surprise any of you. Um, and so in an extreme summary, I think what I found is that sustaining good energy management is difficult. Um, and it's difficult because you need to take a systematic approach. Um, and if you don't take a systematic approach, you might save energy in one spot, but then lose it somewhere else. Um, you need good decision making, which is also kind of not surprising, but not easy when there isn't the right information or experience to support good decisions. Um, and also, and I'm um, sorry, and making, making a change might risk kind of the stable operating point that you already have, and that's never gonna make you friends in an industrial plant. And the other thing I found, and I was very excited um, that David mentioned um, the shop floor and frontline workers, is that the role of frontline workers isn't very well articulated. And I thought this was a particularly interesting one 
given there's lots of recognition out there that the frontline workers in, are important and that includes operation operators sorry and maintenance but if we haven't investigated their role very much then we don't really know the challenges they face when they're undertaking energy activities and we also can't use their expertise when we're trying to come up with solutions so there are kind of a couple of the main difficulties but the other layer of complexity that kind of adds to all this is even though, I, though the IEA are telling us that we should see energy efficiency as our kind of first fuel, it um, isn't very high on the priority level for lots of companies. Um, and also there often isn't someone to coordinate the energy effort, which can span kind of different organisational levels and departments. So when you look at what's making energy management difficult, you start to see that just installing a new pump isn't really going to get you that far. Um, so given that, and that others have recognised the importance um, of the role that people play in all of this, I thought I'd look for a people-based solution. Um, and then I guess, again, knowing as a good engineer that probably people isn't my strong point, I thought I'd look to build on the work of others and see whether there's any other disciplines that have tried to solve similar problems. And so Liz, if you could change the slide for me. And what I found was human factors. Um, and so human factors is a scientific discipline which looks to improve the performance of socio-technical systems and the well-being of workers by changing the system. Often when I talk about human factors, people think I'm talking about behaviour change. But the difference between human factors and behaviour change is that with human with behaviour change, what you're trying to do is make people do something different, which is really very difficult. Whereas with human factors, what you're trying to do is change the system so that it works with what the people want to do naturally. So if we take the example on the slide there from Shipol Airport, um, this kind of us, the fly creates a subtle kind of focal point, encouraging um, people to concentrate on what they're doing um, down there rather than being distracted by a sign that might be asking you to concentrate on what you're doing. Um, so human factors so far hasn't been widely used in the energy field. Um, and I think I only found one set of authors who've used the actual models and tools that human factors um, that are a core part of the human factors discipline. But I really think it has potential. Um, and I think it has potential for a number of reasons. So these reasons are, um, you, can, you don't need to apply human factors to a particular barrier. A lot of the ways that we try and make energy management better or energy efficiency better at industrial sites is, is often overcoming barriers. But if you just focus on the barriers, then you can limit the scope of your solution and possibly limit its effectiveness as well. The other thing you can do by working with people is you can actually use the tools or techniques to enhance drivers. So rather than just trying to remove the thing that's stopping people from doing better, you can actually kind of help them to get, encourage them to get more involved. Um, and then the tools and techniques are also applicable to frontline workers as well as managers. And you can actually use the tools to integrate the efforts of frontline workers and managers, which I think is really how we're always gonna get the best solution. And you'll have to forgive me for the last icon there. I couldn't come up with um, an icon that I thought fit um, human factors has a formative component. So what I'm trying to show you there with the rocket ship is that with human factors, you can design a totally new way to do something, not just try and do what you're already doing better or faster. So the rocket's meant to represent um, just something that's totally new and out there, even though maybe that kind of 70s version of a rocket ship doesn't really So the other thing I see is that I see there's a reasonably good fit between human factors tools and energy management problems. So it's not just that human factors is all about socio-technical systems and energy management is a socio-technical problem where socio-technical just means that there's technology and psychology and like basically people and equipment involved. Um, 
but human factors interventions have also been used in other areas like aviation or healthcare or even the military to deal with the kind of problems that energy management is currently grappling with. So it has models that allow you to investigate human decision making, to look for the information that people are using and also check at what level people are thinking about, or what level people are thinking when they're kind of investigating these problems. And it also has other models which can be particularly useful where you break down a particular goal of a system into the different problems to be solved and the different people involved. And so when you break down the problems in that way, you can see whether um, certain people have too much to do or others have too little to do and you can see where your systems and processes are breaking down. And also, as I mentioned before, human factors can be used to create totally new solutions. And I think this is kind of important in a field that's been around like for quite a long time. And even though we've had some success, we're really not delivering as much as we could or as much as we're, ex like it, as much as we're expected, to do, expected to. So that kind of talks a bit about, or that talks about features and fit. So the next part is field, st field study. So I actually had a go at trying to use some human, a human factors intervention at um, an alumina refinery here in Australia to see if we could improve the performance of the heat exchangers in their digestion se section. So the heat exchangers are there to heat up pregnant liquor and return clean condensate to the refinery's condensate tank. The tricky part about these exchanges, and I don't know if anyone's done any work in the minerals processing area, but the tricky part about these exchanges is you generally work them pretty hard and they get pretty fouled and so then they want to spring leaks. And the hard part when they spring a leak is that you actually leak pregnant liquor into your condensate. And so then your condensate gets dirty and goes off on conductivity. And you do not want, as you all know, high conductivity water ending up in your condensate system that ends up back in your boilers because that's going to be a disaster. So if they spring a leak and you get condensate that's off spec for conductivity, what the site tends to do is they open up the drain on the exchanger and they just dump that condensate to the, to the um, to the drain or to the deck as they call it. But what that means is you lose water, but of course you also lose valuable heat. And so that makes it expensive and also actually potentially unsafe. So it's a bad place for the refinery to be. So if you take a human factors approach to this problem, rather than investigating heat exchanger technology, what you start by is going to talk to people at the site. So I spoke to seven frontline workers and three managers to collect information on how the site worked, how energy management worked there in a general kind of sense, and how the heat exchanges were managed. Unsurprisingly, oh, it's quite the fade. Unsurprisingly, um, by talking to people, we found lots of things where they could do, um, lots of things they could do to improve heat exchange um, in their digestion section. Um, and so some of the opportunities the site knew well, but actually some of the opportunities were a bit surprising. One of my favourite surprises, and maybe not in a good way, was actually the condensate recovery opportunity that we identified here. So it was going to be quite expensive to fix and a medium effort for not that much return. But the thing that I liked about it was we actually brought some new, new knowledge into the refinery. What I found when I was talking to the frontline workers, that was was that when operators were asked to go and check the heat exchangers to see if they were draining condensate, um, you might imagine that the first thing the operators did was go outside and look at the exchangers to see which ones were draining, but that's not actually what they did. The first thing the operators would do is actually check the level in the condensate tank because they had been had bad experiences one too often, once too often, I'm sorry, with putting um, high conductivity condensate back into their heat exchangers and then lost the whole system. So this was new information from the refinery, for the refinery. And so what it means is when you find that out, you can make a much more targeted solution. Um, if you don't feel like operators are checking um, heat exchangers often enough, you might be tempted to put more time in their schedule to, make, to give them more time to do it, or you might ask them to do it more regularly. But if the real problem is actually the level in the condensate tank, doing either of those things isn't really going to help you. So as I said, that kind of brought some new, new information into the refinery and also would have had a big um, impact on how you would fix that one. 
Um, so I also thought I would show you just for interest um, what I guess you would call a raw human factors output looks like. So this um, table doesn't look, or it looks quite simple, I think, but it actually takes a bit of time to get here. So this is called a contextual activity template. And what you do with this is you take one of the goals of your system and you break it down into the problems to solve, which are the, all the questions on the left. And then you look at who deals with those things and that's the names across the top there. So they're the roles that could be involved in solving that problem. And the circles show you who's, is, who is the main person responsible for getting that problem solved. And the extent of the um, boxes shows you who may also be involved. And when you look at this, um, and so this particular one was for maximizing heat exchanger outlet temperature. And when you look at this, um, for me, and it takes a little bit of time, but there's two things that stick out. The first one, and probably another kind of big, a bigger finding for the refinery, is the one right down the bottom there that says, did my actions make a difference? So in talking to different people about what they did and their role in maximizing this heat exchanger, maximizing heat exchanger outlet temperature, we realized it was nobody's responsibility to find out whether the changes that were made in an attempt to maximize the heat exchanger temperature actually did anything. Now, it seems a bit surprising when you say that out loud, but everybody kind of thought it was somebody else's actual job. And it doesn't mean it never got done. So sometimes, an engineer might get interested or a supervisor, a shift supervisor might be really keen to know whether it worked. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it was nobody's job to do that. And I don't know about you, but I'm really hard to motivate if I don't feel like I'm doing valuable work. And if you don't know whether your actions have made a difference, it's really hard to convince yourself that you're doing valuable work. The other thing that stood out to me there is that this maximizing heat exchanger temperature role is really very much seen as an operator's responsibility. But if you look at this depiction of that problem, you can see that the field operator is only really directly responsible for one part of all the problem solving. And they're very dependent on information from the engineers, for instance, to see what they've got to do. And again, given it's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week kind of operation, being dependent on people who aren't there all the time for information makes it pretty hard for you to, to do your job. So sadly though, the human factors analysis doesn't tell you exactly what to do to fix these things, but it does show you where the gaps are and it gives you a much better chance of designing a solution that, that addresses the actual problem. So unfortunately today I don't have a nice graph to show you about how this intervention like turned their energy use around and how much money they saved or how many um, emissions they saved. But what I think I've done, um, because it, in effect, actually, we just ran out of time to take the, implement, take the interventions beyond an investigation stage. But I think I was able to show that it's worth trying to do more to investigate this human factors discipline and how it applies to energy management and what we can get out of it. So to finish, I just, to finish, I'd just like to say, I think as we all know, which is why we're here, sustaining good energy management can be difficult. Um, frontline workers are not well represented in literature. So I'm also very glad, as I said before, that David is also looking into shop floor issues, um, which means that the challenges they face are largely unrecognized and their expertise is missed when formulating solutions. So human factors has not been widely used for energy management interventions, but it has much to offer. The downside is it does take some time and skill to apply. So I think what we need to do or what we'd be good to do is to see what we can take from human factors to improve solutions that we implement with kind of the minimum possible um, in time investment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kelly, for this very interesting presentation. I have to admit, I expected a, a presentation really on, on, on a change of behavior, and it was uh, very mixed up with technical details. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, now the question to Helene. Um, any questions from the, from the audience to, to no. Kelly? No. What a to pity. Be more yeah. active and ask questions. 
Yeah. Um, still, I have one um, one question at hand from my side. Um, in a way, it uh, it's it's also again about um, non-energy benefits, if I understand it correctly. So uh, you have the energy management issues, but on the other side, you have uh, operational uh, issues, uh, um, keeping the, the, the site uh, operational uh, in, in, in case that there happens anything. How do you see this, um, this, this topic? And, and, and does it give... Um, and what are your recommendations to, um, w w without further uh, research, uh, to 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 get people more involved in, in into these um, topics? Um, so I think there are a few things that you can do without actually going into the depth of the research. So there was a few things actually that. I did somewhat by accident um, when I was trying to move our energy management program at BP from a reporting place to um, to more of an action place where actually something happened um, and we actually made some improvements. Um, and I think one of the first things to do is just not underestimate the wealth of knowledge you've got out there in your front line. So if you're looking to um, improve your energy efficiency or there's a particular energy management initiative that you want to take up, um, if you talk to your front line, talk to your operators, talk to your shift managers, and you, I'm not sure exactly everyone has their own name, but if you talk for the, to the people sitting in the control room, they will have ideas about how to fix things. And if you talk to them about what, the prob what you see the problems as and try and involve them in fixing things, then you've got a much better chance of them actually doing the things you want them to do. You might find out some new information, but you also take them with you on the journey the more operators see energy efficiency or energy management as a manager's problem, the less they'll get involved. And I think we've all got more to do in any given day than you've really got time to. So what you really want, and I guess the other thing, I mean, we talk about priority in a technical sense, but if you're working at um, you know, an industrial site, you've kind of got, so safety is always your number one priority. And then you've got production is number two. And then there's kind of long-term unit health not breaking anything. So you're really dealing with number four at the best possible case. So you really want people to be involved with you and come with you on the journey um, because you're looking for their discretionary effort. You're trying to capture that little bit of time that they've got to get involved in energy management issues. So you can do human factors stuff by just going and talking to your frontline and seeing what might stop them from getting involved in an energy management program or doing energy management on a day-to-day. -day. Um, I hesitate to just say information because I think how you supply information and what you supply to people can either be a stick you beat someone with or something that's quite um, uh, motivating. But I think making sure people have got the right information in front of them is also like a good way to get involved with the human factors kind of side of things um, because it's, information that people are going to use or sometimes people use information to make, make decisions but you want to supply them that with that information so that it's easy to find so that maybe eventually they will use the actual information as opposed to um just working on the mental models they've got stuck in their head from six years ago so i think they're the two kind of two big things is to get out into the into the plant and talk to people about stuff and also kind of have a think about your information that you provide to people and see whether you're actually giving people the tools they need to to do the job. Okay, thank you. And if you're saying, okay, go to, out to the people and talk to them, that's a more informal way of, of getting suggestions and ideas. Uh, how do you think about formalized ways like an idea box and, and giving bonuses to, to the best ideas? Would this be uh, a successful path or is it just uh, a way to, okay, Let's um, let's put some 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 dollars into the box, and um, uh, yep. we have some ideas, and let's get rid of this this stuff. So from people management perspective. love people love to be rewarded for their effort, but you need to make sure they're rewarding them for their actual effort. So one of the things that I had changed, or I was in the process of changing, we had operations manager approval, and then they announced the refinery was going to shut down, and all interest was lost. 
Um, we used to give the operators a bonus. So the oil industry uses a terrible metric called EII, and I hope there's no one from Solomon listening, um, which is energy intensity index, which is just a massive rolled up metric of how well the whole refinery is doing um, for its energy. So it's kind of a, what energy you actually used, but you get to kind of net out anything you flare, so it's not real anyway, and then divide by what um, this particular calculation says you should have used. Um, and we used to actually offer our operators a bonus if the number was below a certain level. That didn't motivate anybody though, because it was such a big rolled up metric that it didn't actually apply to any individual. Nobody could really see how they were changing it or how they could get into it. So I think offering rewards, so extrinsic rewards um, still work, but you need to apply it to something that people can actually have some control over and can actually make a difference to. Um, as for suggestion box, maybe that's something to throw open to other people. It's not something I've tried, not something I've read about. But I think if you tell people you're going to take their suggestions and do something with them, however you get it, whether it's through talking to them or whether through the suggestion box, you actually need to make some visible progress. Otherwise, you will kind of send people the other way. Okay. Thank you. And meanwhile, there's a question by Shankar. Uh, I'll read it to you. Do you have any recommendations on how to evaluate the, evaluate the performance of these measures? We all know it can be hard to prove these measures work. <laughs> um, so Shankar's just kind of um, preempting the next phase of my PhD. <laughs> um, so, so there are some very simple um, human factors intervention or some inter human factors type interventions that you could use that you could very um, simply actually and quantifiably see if they work. So there's a sort of um, display, control room display, which you'd call a human centered display or an ecological interface design, which is where instead of giving people kind of a schematic display, you give them some dials and indicators and stuff so that you can look at the display and very quickly figure out what the problem is. And so it actually um, for production or upset conditions, that's actually been proven with the time it takes, not in energy, but in kind of just general operation, they've actually shown that people can pick up deviations faster um, with those kind of displays. So you could do a similar thing with energy. And so that's something um, if I can get the display designed in, in an appropriate amount of time that I'm looking at. Um, the other thing you can do is, is really a bit more nebulous and it's about trying to put the design in um, and just asking people whether they find it easier and, and trying to get enough that you can do some kind of stats on that, which may not satisfy kind of the hard, most hardline um, technocrats and numbers people. But I think, I think it's probably good enough. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Very interesting. Um, let's move on to the uh, last presentation of, of today's uh, panel. Uh, presenter is uh, Shanka Earni. I hope I pronounce your name correct. Is it? Shankar oh, Erni, yeah. Shankar okay. Erni, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, is a program manager in the Building Technologies and Urban Systems Division at uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, supporting the U.S. Department of Energy to develop, implement, and evaluate energy projects, including developing processes, tools, and resources to support the implementation of energy projects. And his presentation is about... Um, the standardized M&V approach of quantifying the effects of static, fact, state, static factors through non-routine adjustments. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, it's nice and early here in California. Uh, again, my name is uh, Shankar Ernie. Uh, today I'm gonna, 
the title of my paper is Non-Routine Adjustments Towards Quantifying Measurement and Verification Approaches for Quantifying the Effects of Static Factors. So that's quite a mouthful, but uh, it's, uh, in general, it relates to measurement and verification and how best to evaluate measures, projects, and to some extent programs. So my co-author is Peter Thorkelson. Again, we're both from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Our group specifically focuses on uh, 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 energy and environmental related issues. Uh, uh, so in terms of introductions, kind of set the stage here, uh, measurement and verification is a key aspect of uh, an, an, any man energy management program. So this is how you evaluate how your measures or projects are performing compared to a, a baseline. Uh, IPMVP, which is kind of the, the widely accepted protocol, which is I, International Pro, uh, Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol, uh, kind of broadly uh, categorizes uh, measurement and verification approaches into what they call it retrofit isolation based approaches, which are option A and B where you isolate the system and, uh, and uh, compare the pre-performance with post-performance at, at a much localized level. Uh, and there is this whole facility level, which is where you're evaluating the, the facility as a whole or a plant as a whole by looking at the overall energy consumption. Uh, b b both these categories of approaches have their place, but uh, uh, option B and C are mostly uh, they, you, they they're called meter based approaches and uh, with the with the prevalence of uh, high frequency data and all this uh, emergence of IOT and machine learning B and C have taken much uh, higher uh, they, they come into focus lately uh, uh, again they they, they Again, at the end of the day, measurement and verification is basically a way to, as I said, evaluate at the, uh, where you're trying to balance the savings and certainty with costs. Uh, kind of pictorially uh, looking at this, uh, on the right, you see there's a baseline energy consumption and then you do an intervention. And then you, you're comparing your uh, project, we're calling it adjusted baseline with the actual energy consumption to basically calculate the savings. So this adjusted baseline is, is something that, uh, that involves developing a model where you take the baseline energy consumption before the intervention has happened and, and uh, basically come up with a regression model that correlates the energy consumption with uh, some key variables uh, so that the you're comparing, you're comparing apples to apples here. Uh, routine adjustments, again, uh, adjustments can be divided into routine adjustments and non-routine adjustments. Uh, routine are basically you're adjusting for factors that are expected to change. For example, outside air temperature, if that's the one of the independent variables, it can be one of the one independent variables and also production quantities. And there will be also some in the buildings world, they also use time of week, which is kind of a proxy for the occupancy. So uh, again, pictorial on the right. So you, you have this uh, energy consumption uh, in the beige, in beige and uh, the temperature is shown in red. So you're basically taking the temperature and uh, the actual energy consumption and correlating them together to develop a model. In this case, we also use time of week to come up with a model uh, that's shown in the blue. So the blue is is very uh, is able to capture the variation in energy pretty close, pretty tight, uh, pretty pretty well. Although it's missing some of the peaks and valleys, but fairly, it's a, a good model. So that's the routine adjustments. As I said, most of the the literature and most of the work happened in the routine adjustment space because as I said, it's, it's a prevalence of data and the machine learning and thing, things like that that have uh, uh, brought that into focus. But the one missing 
aspect of, of uh, uh, developing these baseline models is this non-routine events. So these are events that are caused by changes in static factors. When we say static factors, these factors are supposed to remain static, but they, they will likely change because of it, because of uh, different circumstances. Like for example, COVID, uh, although COVID wasn't the driving factor, but that, that generally, that uh, is something that uh, that can be considered a non-routine event. Uh, so uh, these are, again, uh, these are changes. The non-routine events are are caused by changes in energy use that are not directly attributable to to the uh, installed energy efficiency measures and then are not accounted in the baseline. So you didn't factor that in your baseline. So you, in order to adjust for those, uh, you need to come up with some kind of adjustments to so that the, uh, uh, the savings uncertainty is not compromised. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, on the plot, in the plot on the right, you see the energy consumption has dropped significantly in May, uh, although you didn't see any significant change in the energy, uh, a significant change in the outside air temperature. Assuming the energy outside air temperature is correlated, so there's something that's happening at the facility that needs to be investigated to, to adjust for this uh, energy consumption. So in terms of problem definition, so this is how we kind of break it down in the paper, but at, at a broadest level, there hasn't been a standardized and transparent way to adjust for these non-routine events. Uh, so uh, at, a, at, a, at a very high level, uh, uh, it can be broken down into three parts where you want to define what a non-routine event is uh, clearly so that you're not looking for all these noises. You're looking for that signal, which is, uh, which is something that you care, care for uh, and care about. And, and then there is, a, and uh, once you know what you're looking for, uh, how do you detect it? Mostly the detection happens uh, by a human in the loop, but uh, there are other quantitative based approaches that we're gonna get into later. And then third aspect is adjusting the baseline to quantify for, quantify for that effect. So that's how you break it down. And I get into some of the details in the paper, but that's, uh, uh, that's how we define the problem. So uh, defining the non-routine or characterizing. So the way that we kind of approach this is we've looked at the various literature to see how various uh, uh, resource, how various uh, uh, guidelines, protocols, and standards are dealing with this issue. And we kind of summarize it here uh, in terms of how they define our NRE. So we, uh, you, one can look at the magnitude of the change, so low and high, again, those have to be defined as uh, it depends on your spe specific use case, uh, whether you're interested in 5% reduction, 10%, so you have, to, uh, you have to specify that magnitude, and then there's the duration aspect, uh, whether uh, there can be changes that only last for a few weeks, and there are some changes that can last forever, so... Uh, uh, frequency uh, is something that also can be uh, useful to look at. Uh, for example, something that's happening every Sunday or every uh, uh, every uh, first week of November, something that you want to focus on. And also phase. Uh, is this something that only happens during the baseline or something that happens during the post-retrofit? So there, there is various ways to kind of look at it, uh, 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 look at this, uh, from uh, different angles. So once once you define what you're looking for, what your uh, what how we are in our, what what your NRE is, so, uh, so the next uh, step in the process is detecting it. Again, most of the uh, most of the uh, this most of this detection happens uh, using. A, a, a person on the ground that's familiar with the, the operation. So somebody says, okay, we've added an additional shift or we've outsourced some 
operations or we added a new production line. So this is something that has to come from, that mostly comes from the, from the operations. But that's not always possible because you, the plan manager, the energy manager might be, might be overseeing a lot of facilities. So it's always better to have some quantitative based approaches, we're calling statistics, statistical based approaches to supplement or augment this human, uh, uh, human. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of techniques that people have used in the energy domain. Uh, and also the techniques that can be borrowed from other domains like statistical process control where they look for process limits and such. So one such, uh, again, we get into some of these details in the paper to kind of give you a flavor here. Uh, the statistical, uh, is something called QSUM chart that's very well used in the energy domain where they, they look at the accumulation of savings. So from month one through 12 is considered a baseline. And from year, uh, month 13 onwards, you start accumulating the savings. The savings uh, accumulate at a certain rate. And around month 17, you see a, a upward shift in the, uh, in, the, in the slope. So that means you're, uh, you're having, you're seeing more savings. So that's something that that might be worth investigating as to what's happening. And also around month 25, you see, uh, you see uh, another sh downward sh shift in the savings. So but again, the, this is looking at the monthly data, but there are techniques like this that can be used um, to, to kind of uh, look at this problem uh, to identify these non-routine events. Another, if you have much granular data, um, uh, kind of zooming in on certain uh, days or months can be helpful. For example, on the top right, we see a sh around May 21st or so, we shift, we see a shift in the, uh, there's a higher peak. Uh, so that's, that's another way to look at it. And those you can also use heat maps and things like that. Uh, again, we get into some of those details uh, in the paper, but this is just to kind of give you an example as to how this might look like. Uh, in terms of quantifying, so now we detected the change. Uh, the other aspect is how do we quantify it? So the most uh, uh, common way or mo most commonly used approach is through the use of submetering. Uh, so people, the folks have, uh, uh, it's a, uh, once you know the affected system, you slap on it. For example, you might have added a new facility or a new building, or you add a new production line. So all, uh, uh, all you have to do is slap a meter on and then uh, collect the post-NRE post data. And that essentially becomes your, uh, your adjustment after doing some, some, some adjustments. Uh, and the other way to deal with it is redefining the baseline. Uh, so for example, you might add, you added a new production line that you didn't account for in the baseline. So adding this new independent variable to account for the new production can be, can be considered a way to qu quantify the effect of that. And there's this thing called pre-post model that uh, measurement and verification uh, folks have used uh, where they add a new indicator variable in the regression model that essentially becomes your way to quantify the effect. Um, and also there's this thing called pre, mini pre and mini post where you take a little bit of data before the event has happened uh, and uh, data after the event has happened and you basically see what the difference is and making some adjustments gives you the way to quantify the effect. And another way to do it is some kind of a bottoms up engineering based calculations. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's used, uh, but it comes with its own set of challenges. And again, uh, in, the, in the buildings world, which is somewhat related, uh, they use simulation based approaches to, to, to basically model the change or event, and then you adjust for that using those simulation-based approaches. So that's the first part of the study. The, f the first part of study is basically looking at the lay of the land to see how people have addressed these three aspects, the, the characterization piece, detection piece, and the adjustment piece. And then we we try we, we came up with a framework, and then we, we try to see what has, what's actually happening on the ground 
related to a very specific program. Uh, DOE, the U.S. Department of Energy, has this Superior Energy Performance Program that that recognizes excellence in energy management. This is a way to uh, attain the ISO 50001 uh, certification. So they have their own energy uh, measurement and verification protocol. Uh, but the, one of the key aspects of their program is to whenever uh, uh, the applicants have a, the, a see, excuse me, see a need for uh, a non-routine adjustment, they have to fill out this detailed application. Basically, rationalizing, providing a rationale as to why they want to uh, adjust for these uh, uh, events. So th th to, uh, this is a way to make sure that they're not tampering with the savings. So, uh, 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 so the, we, we looked at several of those applications trying to see how they're addressing these different aspects. And based on our, our review of those applications, um, uh, this is some of the uh, findings that we were able to gather. So most of the, as, as I talked about, most of the uh, applicants uh, they detected the change based on the, the, the information on the ground. Uh, most, of the, uh, uh, most of these adjustments are related to the addition of a new process equipment that was supposed to increase their operational efficiency. Uh, most of these events happen during the achievement period, which is right after the uh, baseline period. And uh, most of these savings or most of these adjustments were related to electricity and they ranged from one to 20%. Uh, it, it, that's, uh, that's the, now getting to the quantification side of things, we, uh, again, there are some examples. We, we get into the details. We looked at 16 case studies and we document them in a table in the, in the paper, but this is just to kind of give you uh, some of the, some of the uh, uh, examples here. There was a case where they added a new production line. Uh, so what they ended up doing was they recreated the, uh, they, they, they adopted a new baseline model that essentially added a new regression coefficient to quantify that fact, so, so very similar to what we talked about before. And uh, a lot of them used submetering based approaches with some, some uh, adjustments and, and uh, projections. Uh, and there was also a case where they used uh, a, a pre-NRE and a post-NRE type model to adjust for savings. Uh, and there was a case where they, they relied on submetering. Uh, for example, there was a case where they, they had to deal with some uh, welding machines that were remote. So they did some submetering there. And there was also cases where they were uh, used, they had to rely on some engineering based calculations because submetering was not an option. Uh, again, this is a quick run through as to how, how, how uh, uh, what people have done for this program, but you can I'll get into, I'll, I, I, I was, uh, we get into a lot more detail in our, in our paper. Uh, in, in summary, uh, the, as I said, most of the work thus far in the measurement and verification space has been focusing on the routine adjustments, but uh, we think that there should be some kind of a standardized way and transparent way to, to account for these uh, non-routine adjustments. Uh, we need a standardized definition and framework to characterize and document these NREs. And uh, uh, we, uh, we have to, further investigation needs to be done in, to, to, into these quantitative based approaches because they, they tend to be much cheaper and you have to find uh, uh, which, uh, you have to find ways on how these can be applied and, uh, and what, under what cases they, they apply. Uh, also, we need to make sure that uh, the, uh, there are NREs that we have are truly due to static factors and nothing related to the deficiency in the performance of the underlying measures. Uh, we need to establish uh, ways to quantify these effects, uh, uh, again, the quantification side of things. And uh, as like any other approaches that you use related to MNV, there's inherent uh, uh, uncertainty, so you need to make sure that uh, 
uh, there's a way to quantify the uncertainties due to these approaches. Uh, uh, again, as I said, when we started this work about a year ago or so ago, uh, we weren't looking at COVID, but certainly that is a big aspect. We keep getting questions on how this can be applied to COVID, but uh, uh, but that's it still had to be determined. But but in terms of uh, yeah, that that's my last slide. Uh, uh, this work, as I said, is funded by Department of Energy, Advanced Manufacturing Office. Uh, based on our work, uh, we started this new application guide with uh, 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 Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, working alongside with EVO, Efficiency Evaluation Organization, have started working on this application guide uh, that's supposed to be released in the next month or so that focuses on uh, non-routine events and adjustments. Uh, we get into a lot more details on how these methods can be applied. But uh, in a nutshell, that's uh, my paper. Uh, that's my contact info. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Shankar, for your presentation. Um, the first question to Helene, are there any questions? But my first guess would be no, there are no questions. But there is. There, there is. is one. Oh, yes, great. there is yeah. one. Uh, it is a question for Shankar and Kelly, uh, which is very interesting. How can you share the types of data that Shankar showed with frontline operatives? Are they valuable tools for starting discussions of energy management? So it's for both of you with different aspects. So I, I can go, but I'm not sure what exact data they were referring to, but the data that we were looking at was, again, it's not data per se. It's, it's basically, as I said, it's an application where uh, the applicants fill out to justify their non-routine adjustments. It's, it's, more it's more qualitative than quantitative, but overall measurement and verification uh, can be a valuable tool to, to understand any, uh, how your systems are performing and, and detect any underlying problems. Yeah, and so I think frontline workers can be a part of that system. So there's some of the static factors. It may be the frontline workers that see that if it's a problem with a particular set of exchanges or pump or something big that's out, I mean, they're gonna be the first people that deal with that. And I guess on the flip side of it, um, I'm not sure if you also feed information from the models back to the frontline workers and say, hey, there's a deviation here we don't understand. Um, could you help us out? Or on the flip side of that, say, hey, you guys are doing awesome this month. Can you tell me, you know, what have you been doing differently? Because we're saving so much more. Um, so I think the measurement and verification information, like it can go both ways. You can use it both as a motivator. Um, well, I guess there's a three ways there, isn't there? There's, you could use the information as a motivator or you could use them, the knowledge of the front users, a terrible word, but you could involve frontline workers in finding out why something's gone bad or on the other side, finding out why something's gone good so you can repeat it. Does that answer the question somewhat? Yeah, I would think so. Thank you. One, one question to, to Shankar from, from my side. Um, what's the old ultimate goal of your, uh, of your research? To make uh, the whole also non-routine adjustment uh, automatically? That's, that's the goal, but, but in California, and specifically uh, in California, I mean, there are other parts in the US that are focusing on these advanced meter data. This is the data that comes out every 15 minutes. So the people have been using that data for measurement and verification to, as a way to conduct MNV cheaper, better, and faster. Uh, so uh, one kind of the missing piece is this non-routine events. So at the end of the day, you want to make sure that these adjustments are somewhat are done for a reason and not a way to tamper. If your program doesn't meet the savings, you can't go, go and find these adjustments. 
<laughs> so we have to tamper it. I worked for UNESCO before, and then it's, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens. Uh, before, uh, 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 I've seen some stuff that happened in my former life, and uh, that's that's one of the motivations for this study. Okay. Um, yeah, Helena, do you have any questions? Um, no, not really. Okay. So um, in the end, we move to the uh, last part of this uh, panel session, um, discussion among us all. And I would uh, direct uh, one general question to, to all three of, of, of the presenters. Um, the human factor uh, was very interesting in all the presentations in different ways, yeah? Um, in, in one presentation, it was, uh, okay, we need the, 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 the front workers uh, and, and their, um, their knowledge. Uh, in one presentation, it was, okay, we have the decision makers uh, that uh, have to be involved and we have the uh, humans uh, in the first place to, to, to at least detect false alarms if, if a system detects a non-routine uh, adjustment, for instance. Um, the question is, um, how to make it very general, um, so it fits to all the presentations, and not, not so easy. Um, the, the human factor can be eliminated, I, I hope so at least. Um, um, how do you see the, the future of human uh, decision making in energy management systems and also in monitoring systems? Who wants to go first? Um, so I can go first. I don't okay. think I don't think we'll get rid of people, and I don't think we should try. I think um, often, and I guess I draw some of the analogies from safety, which is part of the UQ risk focus. Um, we often see people as um, villains and, you know, people make mistakes and they do things wrong and they don't do it the same way all the time. Um, and I think that applies to kind of any industrial process where you're looking at a person to optimise or make something better and they can do that. But then there's also lots of... Um, situations where there's people as heroes, where people are much better able to deal with um, un unanticipated events, for instance, um, than a machine is, or then even, I think probably even where AI is in general, because if nobody anticipated the event, then that you can't have put that into your programming or coding. And so I think as energy management gets more technical and more scientific, the kind of unanticipated things I think are going to come up more often. And so you need a person to deal with those. Having said that, um, and I'll just spruit the human factor stuff once more, that those tools and ideas that come up in that discipline don't go away either because some of, and again, the examples come from safety, but um, good human factors analysis can underpin a really good automated system because it looks quite specifically at all the problems you need to solve and what would be involved and where the breakdown points might be. So it actually, um, even if then the humans are more removed from the system in the end, um, to get a good system, you need to use those kind of tools to set it up. Yeah, yeah, I agree that, uh, that I don't think we can eliminate humans uh, uh, from, this, from, from this system. Yeah, I think we, as I as I mentioned in my talk, uh, the the quantitative based approaches can only go f so far. So it only will detect that there is a change, but it's up to the human or person on the field to ascertain that's indeed a a change that's because of a non routine event uh, and not something that's caused by an, a deficient ECM or EEM energy conservation measures. So at the end of the day, it's, it's, we're trying to augment the capabilities of the human by using these database approaches. Okay, thank you. Um, David, do you have uh, an answer um, to my question? I mean, 
Uh, yeah, uh, I'm. I pretty much agree, actually, on on the other two. Uh, for sure, uh, technology automation um, could support definitely uh, the process of decision making. But uh, but in the end, companies are made up of people, and uh, I see pretty much difficult to uh, automate every process and every decision. Uh, actually, also decision are not. I mean, for what we know, uh, decision maker are not always deciding upon. Uh, objective basis but uh, this we have this sort of subjective uh, dimension which is difficult to uh, to, to replicate from, uh, from automation or technology okay great um, thank you um, we are at the end of our session thanks to all the speakers um, one moment I have to fix something here in my view. Okay. Um, tomorrow there will be another panel on. Uh, uh, on Reinhardt, on, on sorry. The... I think Helene has, has a question, but she's just on mute at the moment. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I have one additional question for uh, Kelly uh, from the audience. And do the companies welcome you to analyze these matters or are they suspicious? Um, so that's, that's a good question. Um, so I've gone into three um, different companies now, two large energy intensive ones and one small, um, uh, one small non-energy intensive, although it depends whose definition you use. We've got several definitions flying around. Um, and so far, I have been made very welcome. Um, I think you need... So, so, so far, I have been made very welcome. Um, when I go to talk to people, though, I am very cognizant that I am... Um, uh, I'm not trying to tell anybody what, what to do. And I'm trying to make very sure that um, the questioning is more of a conversation than um, harsh kind of questions. We also try to make it as easy as possible, particularly for the operators. Um, so I've sat for, you know, an hour or so in a control room at night to get a 15 minute session, like 15 minutes worth of discussion, because that's the easiest way to, to talk to the, to boardman, um, it's just to sit there and be very quiet when they're doing something, and then just talk when they're they're willing. Um, I think if you go with the approach that you guys have got lots to do, you know all this stuff anyway. The thing I add is time, and maybe a little bit of some ideas about something different. Um, then I, I think it can work. I think you could be not so welcome if you take a, a different approach if you're going to walk the line between this is airy fairy and this is important technical work um, but so far I've had good responses okay maybe there are any other questions maybe in the zoom app but I don't think so um, yeah so it's me. It's my turn to say thank you to the speakers and also to the audience. Um, I also want to invite you to uh, the networking session at uh, sixteen zero zero um, Central European time. The link is in the agenda. Uh, it will be an open session in Zoom where people can talk to each other. Um, you're invited to to this. Uh, session uh, and I also would like to uh, see you again tomorrow in uh, the uh, second session of panel three the uh, presenters uh, will most likely be uh, Stefan Linksöld, uh, Werner König, Joachim Globisch and I think also Kokila Arandara if this is the correct agenda thank you for participating uh, I wish you um, good morning, good night, and um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.